Today, um, congratulations on your stamina. Um, my name's Ian Boyd. I work for ARC with, uh, with my colleagues Claire and Nigel George here. Uh, we've travelled from the Isle of Wight to be with you today. UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve. I commend it to you, do visitors. It's an extraordinary and wonderful place. Um, I just want to talk to you in this session about going beyond that game. Um, we were last here two years ago, and at that time it was all buildings and carbon. This year it's all buildings and eco of one sort or another. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's a good thing. Most of it's a good thing. In two years' time, I confidently predict it will be buildings and health, buildings and well-being. What we're not doing is saying this year it's buildings and carbon and eco, and next time it will be buildings and carbon and biodiversity and well-being. And one of the problems is, and I'm going to mention it in just a moment, is that the metrics we live by silo data, and they stop us thinking between those silos. And Sarah's presentation was absolutely perfect. That wonderful, was it Hackney there, Happy Man Tree? What an amazing, amazing resource, and yet it had no value in the planning system at all. It was dismissed as irrelevant, precisely for that reason that we have taken a siloed approach to the way we treat our local environments and the way we respect them, and most importantly, the way we utilize them. It's insane. This has got to change. And that's why we need to go beyond the net gain story. And that's what we're going to talk about. Metrics, they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Oh, my God. There's BNGN, ESG, there's terrestrial carbon, and there's blue carbon, and there's healthy buildings and sophisticated buildings and all manner of buildings. There are metrics everywhere. Now, collecting data is a wonderful and important thing. It gives us access to a crucial resource for decision making. But the metric world and the metric industry, don't forget, I'm not being overly cynical, this is a gold rush. This movement towards a levied system of treating our environment is a gold rush. And all of these metrics in the end are designed to make it efficient and easy to administer. Now, that's not to say they don't have excellent results, they often do. I've seen BNG Biodiversity Net Gain turn an atrociously appalling development scheme, small residential, which is the norm into a slightly less appalling scheme for people to have to live in. Now that, frankly, is still an achievement. It is an achievement, so I'm not dismissing it. But what these metrics do is they create their own reality. They replace the complex, messy world that we inhabit with a very, very clean, icy cold system that we can accommodate much more easily. And it replaces the real world. And it's happening all the time, and it's a damaging process. The data is valuable, the methodology, the way that we utilise that data, is not. So we need to change that and the way to do that, and it's something that my colleague Nigel George has championed on the Isle of Wight, is warm data. It's this idea of living data, of flexible and interactive approaches to the information that we collect. And crucially, a qualitative system. Now, ESG is on a meteoric rise. Environment, social governance, you've seen this. It's driving impact investment. It is driving large built asset investors mad with joy. They can't believe this thing has landed in their laps. It's moving incredibly quickly. But even in that world of asset management, and don't forget, every one of these metrics is a new asset class. It has turned biodiversity into an asset class. It has turned health and well-being into an asset class. That is what is happening. Every one of these uh, metrics cuts us off from considering the qualitative whole, how to engage between those areas. Really simple system with BNG, really simple example with BNG, is the link between zero waste and biodiversity net gain. How many, I don't know if any of you work on development projects, I've worked on them for 30 years, where you'll see a developer on a cut and fill project spend 50, 100,000 pounds carting off inert rubble and perfectly good soil in order to leave the least interesting domain for people and wildlife, flat and green. That's it. And yet that could have been kept to create an interesting topographically varied lumpy landscape, wonderful as a play space, fantastic as an ecological space. So you could have had a recycling, upcycling, reuse agenda in your waste metric combined with a gain for social community, even cultural benefit and ecological benefit and save yourself a shed load of money. But it doesn't happen because the conventions drive us in the opposite direction. The siloed approach to metrics 
pushes us in the opposite direction. We need to reclaim all of this. And there are, there's a word that I think we should have back from the dietary industry, and that is probiotic. Probiotic is a wonderful, wonderful world. It means an environment suitable for life. That is precisely the objective we should all be working towards. Every development, every scheme, every project should be inherently probiotic. Every plan, every program, every strategy should be inherently prebiotic. In other words, setting up the conditions required for life. That is exactly how we should be considering the way that we treat our environment, that we treat our societies, the way we treat the places that we live. So we need to, metrics are good, data is good, we need to recombine them in qual qualitative systems. And I think the ESG journey will take us inevitably in that direction. So, minor out, but moving on to what <laughs> our approach to, to this, in our own small world, and influenced a great deal by the UNESCO biosphere status that I mentioned at the beginning. Biosphere has been with us for 50 years. The integration of cultural life and our relationship with the natural world has been the UNESCO Man and Biosphere. It's called Man and Biosphere, it's a little bit prehistoric, but People and Biosphere, Person, Humanity and Biosphere project is 50 years old. We've known about this for as long as we've known about climate change, and yet we have not implemented it. The two stories run in parallel, they're the same story. So our approach uh, in creating this Shaping Better Places system, it's a framework, it's not a metric, it's a framework, has been to very deliberately recombine these foundation capitals, natural capital, social capital, cultural capital, wildlife and nature, people and place. Those are the three things that we need to recombine to make places suitable for us. Don't forget that every place we build is a habitat for humans. We are unbelievably bad at building habitats for ourselves. The average wren is a master builder. In fact, every wren, not the average wren, every wren is a master builder compared to us in terms of creating domains suitable for its species. We've forgotten how to make habitats for humans completely. And we keep churning out these appalling places with no design uh, imagination in them that is suitable for the well-being of people as a biological entity. All of us are, loosely speaking, medium-sized social mammals, all of us. We are intimately connected with the ecosystems we share and help to shape, and yet we cut ourselves off as, as if we are somehow alien or robotic. We are absolutely not. The ecological story is the human story. We have to put ourselves back in the biota. That is a big project that faces us, putting ourselves back on the species list. Every species that you've ever seen is minus one, and it's you. And that's what we need to work towards, thinking about it in an integrated way. So I just put that up as an example. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. just going to look at the first bit, the natural capital bit, because that relates to where we started about BNG, about biodiversity net gain. So I just want to talk about these three categories in our approach to building natural capital. I don't know if you like Sean Tang, I think he's absolutely wonderful, the best illustrator there is. These are all beautiful illustrations by Sean Tang of urban environments. And I think they capture the feeling of dread really rather wonderfully. It's not to say there aren't great urban environments, of course there are, but overall, generally speaking, they are hostile to the natural world, they are hostile to the human world because we've forgotten how to build them as habitats for humans. So this is all about getting hold of the development, planning and infrastructure process and making it fit for purpose for us. So the first one I want to talk about is N1 in our little uh, system, our, our little calculator, is to revive built environments, grey, green and blue, the three infrastructures, by grouping life cycle resources for wildlife. It's all about life cycle. Bottom left, if you want white letter hair streaks, and we all want white letter hair streaks, you have to have the food plant, which is elms. We can now get disease resistant elms. We've got 10 or so cultivars growing on the other hand, easily had. The point is, though, we tend to miss out, for example, larval forms. We like the adult form. We like the beautiful butterfly. We don't like the caterpillar. We love the hoverfly. We don't like the grub. But we have to allow for life cycle resources in everything we do. We need to provide space to feed, to breed, to overwinter, to hibernate, to pupate, to display, to bask. All of these things are essential. You can capture all of them in a single planter, not that one. 
If you want to, you can boil the whole thing down into a microcosm and stick it in a pot. If you think about the way we treat our public spaces and our, develop, our developed areas as uh, providing these life cycle resources for biodiversity. So what would that mean for that plant? It would mean everything in it was edible. Everything in it was edible from a wildlife point of view. The foliage, pollen, nectar, seeds, fruits, berries, the root systems, everything in it is providing some kind of forage resource for something. Some of those plants would have hollow stems, fantastic overwintering habitat for earwigs, ladybirds. What about the depth of soil? Those plants don't need anything like that amount of soil. Why are we filling these things to the top and then using that much of their actual space? Can we think about subterranean spaces? Can we bury objects, rubble, interesting things with voids and holes and cavities? Yes, of course we can. And that provides another kind of habitat, subsoil. Can we think about the structure itself that is smooth? completely smooth, not a speck of anything living on it. Can we drill holes in it? Yes, absolutely we can drill holes in it. Can we stick things to it? Can we hack into it? Can we bolt stuff onto it? Can we create an environment in the container? It's not just the thing contained, it is the container. What about underneath? Can we prop it up on little feet so there's a shady, dark, damp environment beneath? Brilliant, absolutely perfect for some things to spend their life. You can think about this microcosm if you think about the life cycle resources. Spread that out over the way that we plan and landscape our environment and you begin to generate ecological density. You begin to pull in species into urban spaces. So everything we do should be edible. Every feature we build should contain these life cycle resources. It's a simple way of building up ecological value right in front of our eyes. And if you repeat these features, you draw wildlife into our space, we encounter the natural world that is simply good for us. It is 30 years of research tell us a contact with the natural world is good for us. And the more we do that, the better we are, the more we're able to think imaginatively about doing even better in terms of drawing wildlife effectively and sustainably into urban places. So that's the first approach. Think about life cycle resources. And that, of course, includes also things you can buy and make. The beauty of this approach is that rather than pushing nature to the edges, fencing it off and calling it done, condemning it to a life under a management company that isn't particularly interested in it and seeing it simply disappear and having no engagement with it whatsoever, you're pulling it right into the heart of the way that people live in the places that people live. So the middle one is a swift tower. Fantastic, a sculptural, beautiful thing. On the left is a hole in a wall. We need more holes in walls. The wall will not fall down. Not yet, anyway. Holes in walls are fantastic for things. That's Anthophora, the hairy-footed flower bee. Fantastic, they're nesting in their aggregations of bees. The thing on the right is a beautiful thing created by Nigel George here. It is a biototem. It is a reconditioned and therefore upcycled oak sleeper with a pattern of holes drilled in it for mason bees and leafcutter bees with a beautiful uh, pattern burnt on it, an icon, an emblem that you can then use to interpret that place, unique to the place it is in. You can use this as way markers to guide people through this urban domain from one intervention for wildlife to another intervention for wildlife. We can be imaginative. Crenellated concrete surfaces take big surface areas, condense them down into small surface areas. The small wildlife we're talking about we'll find more space to inhabit as a consequence. We need texture, we need complexity, we don't need super hygienic smooth surfaces everywhere. Wouldn't it be wonderful if some of this cladding on some of the buildings that you see on your journey in here were specifically designed for colonization? Not all of them, one in 10 is fine. They were deliberately allowed to colonize naturally. Don't plan the things, allow them to colonize naturally. There's sufficient aerial plankton and propagules in the atmosphere that it will do it for free. You, you get it for free if you stop scrubbing it away. So we can be imaginative and clever in the way we attract living things. Number two, we need to act vertically as well as horizontally. We tend to restrict our conversations about uh, biological intervention, about enhancement, ecological enhancement, net gain for biodiversity, to the flat bits. What can we plant on this flat bit? Now the tree may have height and structure, but it's still regarded as a dot on a flat map. We need to think about the entire urban volume. We're building extraordinary places of enormous sophistication and complexity. And then we're sticking little shishi green roofs on the top and calling it done. That's nowhere near good enough. 
those green roofs can provide a wonderful platform, lots of xerophytic flora, lots of bare sandy ground, superb for ground nesting bees. But the landscaping at the bottom needs to talk to that. So if you provide the pollen and nectar resources at ground level for the bees nesting at roof level, there is transport, there is transit, visible wildlife movement in the urban domain. You are utilising all the urban spaces that you have available to you. Don't just think about the ground level stuff. Go up and go down. We have a 200 metre volume to play about with in the, the tallest buildings. That's a huge area. Every wall, every surface, every roof is there for us to think about how we can use it to accommodate the natural world and to bring it more into our own lives, how that we can then respond to benefit from it. So we need to think about the full urban volume available to us and connect them so that they speak to each other. You get green walls for free, as we said earlier. Now, of course, there are some times when you don't want this, when it is genuinely dangerous. But I would suggest that is a tiny minority of the cases. It is most often because the contract, as Sarah was talking about earlier, says we can't have anything green on this wall, and therefore we have nothing green on this wall. It is contractual maintenance that is killing these urban spaces, not bricks falling on people. So we have to get over this, we have to allow natural colonisation where it is right to do so, where it's possible to do so in a managed way, and bring that free colonisation back in. Simple plants, simple animals, terraforming species, building up uh, an encounter with the natural world. Moss is just magnificent, it is just superb. The dozen or so species of common urban mosses create habitat for all sorts of things. They're incredibly important pupation habitats for lots of micromoths, for example. More moss, more lichens. We can, we can cope th with this. We're a sophisticated species. We can manage moss and lichen in our lives without chaos or panic. We can do this. We must do this. What about the faux cave fauna of underground stairwells. Why don't we explore that? Full of spiders, full of curious energy transport systems, full of odd and novel and unusual food webs. Let's think about that. Let's think about strange spaces and how they can accommodate wildlife, how they're already accommodating wildlife, and how we can push that idea further. There is nothing we cannot enhance and prove for wildlife and bring it into our lives. Last one. Having thought of these things, about our life cycle resources in this planter, about our top to bottom and below approach to buildings and the built environment, we now start to connect them up. We look over the red line of our development, we look over the fence of our domain at the next interesting space. Is it a school? Is it a park? Is it a ditch? Is it a tiny little urban woodland? What is it? There's something there. Draw a circle about 100 metres around wherever you are working and look for this stuff. 100 metres is quite a nice metric going back to where we started. It's sort of a dispersal distance for lots of small wildlife that's on the move, that's on the wing. So you might be able to do something in your domain and have it actually arrive at the next one. But it might not be yours. Someone else's land, someone else's project. And that pulls us together. It drives collaboration. Wonderful, it's exactly what we need. This is a shared endeavour. This does not belong in these little siloed domains. Siloed metrics drive siloed approaches to real life, and it's very unhelpful. Look over the edge, look over the fence, find the next place within 100 metres, talk to them, replicate what you're doing with them, and on it goes, and on it goes. This network of ecologically meaningful distances more or less operate at the same scale that we do. We have an exploratory distance of about 500 metres. We'll go about half a kilometre in, in, in an unfamiliar environment and then come back. We have about 100 metres in terms of our social distance. We can recognise a human being at 100 metres. At about 70 metres we might know them. At about 30 metres we'll probably know how they're feeling and, and so on. These metrics are really similar because we are mammals, we are social mammals, we are not aliens. We inhabit the same ecosystem, we are bio biological entities, we work to roughly the same metrics. And this is how we can combine successfully these ideas. So 
So replicate, replicate, replicate. Don't just do one planter, do all of the planters you can reach. And when you start to map these opportunities, you find that you're talking to other people, other groups. It drives this fantastic spirit of collaboration. This is a parish map. I don't know, I always meant, try and mention the organisation Common Ground. If you don't know Common Ground, please, please, please look them up. Common Ground, one of the most extraordinary and inspirational organisations there has ever been. They're a very different project-focused organisation now, still doing wonderful stuff in the South West, but they pioneered local distinctiveness, sense of place, parish maps, a manifesto for trees, a manifesto for fields, fantastic stuff. It's all there on their archive, on their website. Have a look at it. It's superb. And this is an example of this beautifully produced parish map speaking to the people who live there. Now think how we can then overlay this idea of going beyond that gain, of doing this, this, this system of interventions for wildlife laid across this cultural map. This interface is natural, social and cultural, exactly what we need to be doing. I put that up at the beginning, I don't know if uh, some of you won't have seen this. This is a wonderful quote. I shan't read it out, I'm sure you can read it much better than I can, uh, than I can read it out. It's from Forrest Stearns, an American urban ecologist, and it's perfect. It talks about what people need in habitats, and we can translate that exactly across into what wildlife needs. We knew it 50 years ago, we still haven't implemented it. We can, and we absolutely must do that now. Final slide. Um, I, just a plea to celebrate the ordinary. We, uh, we dismiss dandelions and brambles far too easily and yet they are quite quite extraordinary dandelions are an, a complex mix of species 250 species of dandelion in the uk 250 species of dandelion so the average park may have more species of dandelion than all the other flowering plants in there and there'll be differences in flowering time in seed production in pollen taste for the things that want to eat it, in nectar taste for the things that want to drink it. So the diversity of forage available just from dandelions is immense. It provides an adaptive resource for species moving ahead of climate change, for example. So dandelions are amazing. Just focusing on dandelions is a project worthwhile doing. Brambles, 325 species of bramble in the UK. Some of them incredibly specific to place and therefore have a cultural significance a cultural role in our lives they may be found in just one town in one place in one town so ordinary stuff is much more interesting than we think it is it has a fantastic cultural and biological value but we need to pull these strands together in the way we think about the places we live and manage we need to go beyond net gain we need to go into this this qualitative approach to the way we collect and use data. It's absolutely crucial and I very much hope that everyone here is going to do just that. So, thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, very good question. Fashionable and unfashionable plants. Weeds and non-weeds. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I think we do. Um, I think it comes back to maintenance of urban spaces. It comes back to the dominance, the tyranny of maintenance, which tends to drive out that kind of uh, relationship between us and, the, and a naturally colonising flora. And I think we need to have a completely different aesthetic. We need to get away from this mad obsession with super hygiene, smooth surfaces and unbelievably boring tidiness. We need to get away from that stuff because it's crippling and it stops us. And it's very expensive as well. So I totally agree, a new aesthetic is required, absolutely. Yeah. Another bit of uh, devil's advocate here. If we've known this for 50 years, why haven't we done anything about it? Um, I have absolutely no idea. I think that is the key. It is, and I think, I think it is a combination of learning and sensibility. We have so much biological data now, we have so much understanding about ecosystem services, about ecological function in, a, in the urban environment. I think that is still relatively poorly formed, if I'm honest. I think we are still stuck in a rural mindset when it comes to biodiversity. So I think that's probably why 
is that urban domains were always considered to be so hostile that they had no wildlife in them at all. And so we were obsessing with protected areas and rural domains. That's true, and then that's good stuff. But urban spaces increasingly, I think, provide a refuge for unbelievably rich biodiversity from an increasingly hostile rural environment in many cases. So I think we're on a, a trajectory in the right direction, but I think it's taken a new focus on the urban world. Perhaps it, you, you get to a critical threshold of urbanisation, I don't know, and then it kicks in. But it, we've got to get on with it. I also think either we end privatisation or the people that own these, um, whatever it is, plots of land, you know, buildings, uh, are for these ideas. Yeah, I, so absolutely. we need a system change. Uh, the role of local authorities and housing associations, for example, super critical. Because these are folks who own stuff forever. Well, they should do, anyway. They get away from disposals. It's maintenance. Maintenance. Let's change maintenance into management. We can accumulate ecological Community benefits. Community management. Absolutely, involving the people who live there. Rather than dumbing it down to the lowest possible level because it is an efficient way of approaching a maintenance contract. Maintenance is key. And the maintenance crews and organisations are so often let out, left out of these discussions. And that's one of the problems. That's where we end up with these atrocious PFI nightmares. We've got one of those. Thank you very much.